G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR. For today's video, we're going to have a long-awaited discussion and take a look at all of the relevant Supercoach options that we can select in our forward lines this year. Now, I'm a little bit concerned about the length of the video, but with some of my other videos that did go for a little bit longer than half an hour, just say, I have got lots of positive feedback. People seem to be enjoying them and getting a fair bit out of them. So set yourself in for a bit of a longer one today. I think we're going for about 50 minutes. Grab yourself a coffee. Grab yourself a cup of tea, but I won't keep banging on the intro. I'll try to keep it short and get to the plays straight away. Now, with the forward line, I'm finding it really tough to gauge this year. There's a few selections that I do like, a few players that I'm sort of 50-50 on, and there's a lot of question marks on some of these blokes between the sort of 400 to 500k mark as well. The structure for today's video is I will start off looking at the top 10 most expensive players, then look at 10 valid options in between the 400 to 500k range, 10 options between 3 and 400k, and then another 10 between 200 and 300k. But what we'll do is we'll look at the 2019 and 2020 most expensive forward options. And as you'll see, it's a bit of a transient line, the forward line. There's not too many names that are there from year to year. Many of these names actually get mid-only status, for example. There's been the Brayshaws, the Petrackers, Hugh Greenwoods, Jai Simpkin that are now only available in the midfield. And if they're available in the forward line, then they'd feature in this top 10 list as well. So a very transient line does move from year to year. If you look in regards to personal bests, we did take a look at the defenders and the midfielders, and there were six and seven blokes out of the top 10 in both of those lines who did have career best years last year. If you look here, there's really no breakout options. And we had Tom Hawkins, career best average. He beat that by four points. And Charlie Dixon beat his previous career average by 1.9 but it's almost looking at this list like we're going back to the well a little bit and trying to determine which one of these players will go down in average which ones will step it up and obviously which ones may just maintain their price and be you know one of those safe top picks but we will start off with the top 10 most expensive players who's going to be at number one at number one, we have Paddy Dangerfield. He'll set you back 611900 For me, anyway, been one of my first selected midfielders over the last five or six years. Been one of those players that we can rely on for healthy averages from year to year. Massive, massive scores. Huge ceiling. Great captaincy option. And even though his form has dipped, or his average anyway, has dipped over the last three years, he's still up there with the uber elite scorers. Even if you compare him to the midfielders this year, he's still 10th in regards to starting price in the midfield as well. So that still shows that Paddy Dangerfield is one of the best scorers in the competition, and in my opinion, one of the best plays in the competition. If you look at his durability also, from 2011, played over 20 games in each season, absolutely fantastic for Supercoach. That's what we want to see. But unfortunately, that leads me to why he's not in my side at the moment. He has been durable, but he did get an injury in the grand final, was hampered by that, and that sort of lingered on, I think, and he's now got some problems in the preseason. He's been seeing a specialist in Adelaide, and at his age, that really does concern me. So if I'm paying 611900 for Dangerfield, and he's not fully fit, red flags for sure. The other concern I have is his role. Now, you may think last year, and I do certainly agree with this, that he still scored well when he played large chunks of time up forward. You know, 113.9, nothing to complain about, to be quite honest. Now, this year, what's going to happen in regards to role? You've got Jeremy Cameron that's added to the mix there. What's going to happen? Is Dangerfield going to spend more time in the midfield because Cameron can spend that time up forward and offer another really, really dangerous target? Or is Chris Scott going to think to himself, well, do you know what? If I play all these three superstars up forward, then their third best defender is going to have to play on one of these guys, and that's going to cause headaches to the opposition coach. So there's two different ways of thinking about it. I think that, well, I'm hoping anyway, that he'll spend a little bit more time in the midfield. He should be able to get freed up, but I think he'll probably be a week-to-week -week proposition. So do I love him as a pick? Absolutely, particularly the fact that we can select him in our forward lines. If a midfielder only, probably wouldn't look too closely at him, but given the fact that we can select him up here, I think that is a real, real bonus for us. But I just can't get my head past the injury. It's just too concerning for me at this stage. Look, he'll be an upgrade target for me. I want this bloke in my team for sure by the end of the season. And I still think that he will average pretty comfortably, to be quite honest, in the top three for forwards by the end of the year. I think he might have a little bit of a slow start if he is not fully fit, as I said, and coming back from that injury. But 
for me, certainly an upgrade target, but have been scared off by that injury, no longer in my side. At number two, we have Steel Sawbottom. He'll set you back 588,000 on the dot. Sublime skills on the left and the right. Been a wonderful player for Collingwood over the last decade. Look at his averages there. His breakout year was back in 2012, where he went from an 83.5 all the way up to a 106.2, and really hasn't looked back after that. Did spike it right up to 113.2 in 2014, pushing that uber elite, but never quite got there again. But still really, really healthy for a 95 plus average. In 2020, he did have his second best year with an average of 109.4. Now, the only concern I've got about that is the fact that it's only over a nine game sample size. Can he maintain the rage this year and keep near that average? I'm really not quite sure. What's his role gonna be? I've asked a few of my Collingwood mates. One said half forward, one said a wing. The other one said, nah, I think he could play a little bit more on the inside because Trelaw's now gone. So I'm not quite sure what to think, to be quite honest, because I respect all their opinions and I can see their merit in each of their opinions as well. So for me, I don't think that there's a heap of value in the starting price. I don't think that he'll probably go near that average again of 110, probably a maybe 100 to 105, but he is a safe selection. And I think that you will still get a healthy average, particularly for a forward. Remember, many years he's only been selected or being able to be selected as a midfielder. So given the chance that you've got in front of you to select him in your forward line, it is a really, really tempting option. So for me, I'm not starting with him. I'm hoping to get him into my side, definitely at some stage of the season, but more of an upgrade target because I think that there's not a great amount of value and I'm looking to get him in, hopefully a little bit cheaper after he has had a couple of poor or average games. So start him if you want. If you don't, I'm fine with that also. At number three, we have the big Tomahawk, Tommy Hawkins. He'll set you back 568,600. The best key forward from last year. Won the Coleman. Terrific year from him and a career best in terms of super coach average. Went up to a 105.8 from a previous career best in 2018 with a 101.8. But look, I'm not a fan of key forwards. I must be honest, particularly at this price, as I said. If you look at his career averages there, apart from 2018, 2020, only two years where he's gone 100 plus. Can we rely on him this year to go above that 100 plus again? Well, I'm really not too sure. With the addition of Cameron, as I said, when I talked about Dangerfield earlier on, I'm really not too sure what's gonna to happen to some of these blokes in regards to scores. Does that mean that Tomahawk's average does go down a little bit because that load will be shared with someone like a Cameron? It's a possibility, but um, look, he's a bloke with a massive ceiling. Um, he can have a low floor at times, you know, around 17, 18, 43, 57. But to be quite honest, he had a pretty consistent season last year. But as a key forward at that price, I'm a big no. If you want a pod, if you want to go different, sure. But I think probably the best thing with someone like a Tomahawk is maybe to wait till he has a couple of really terrible games. He could go right down in price. And if looking for a really cheap upgrade option with a little bit of upside, then you could probably get him in at that stage. But as a starting pick, key forward, two years of 100 plus in a pretty long career now, no as a starting pick for me. At number four, we have Josh Dunkley. He'll set you back 560,200. If you did follow the channel last year, you know that I'm a huge fan of Dunkley as a player. You know, he comes from a family of athletes, an ultra professional, does everything he can off the field to get the best out of himself. And he is an absolute contested beast. I currently have him as my F1, but I do have some slight concerns about this pick. What are those concerns? Well, firstly, we know that he plays for the dogs. Adam Chalor's made his way to the kennel during the off season and we just don't know how they're gonna set up going into 2021. If we look back at Dunkley's 2020 season, for the first three rounds, he did play his preferred role as that inside bull, 67. I don't actually know what happened there, just a poor game from him. We all have those from here to there. But in round two and round three, a 131 and then a 128. So attending a high amount of CBAs, everything was then starting to look rosy. And I actually started him in my midfield last year, but unfortunately got injured after that. We had to trade him out. And then when he came back into the side, he simply didn't get back to that preferred role. He played a little bit in the ruck, played up forward, a little bit through the midfield, just played all over the shop, and he just couldn't get any consistency to his game. His CBA attendance went right down. Blokes like Leobar, Baz, their CBA attendance sort of went up when he went out of the side. So that is a big concern going into this year. Where are they actually going to play him? Now, we can rule out that he's going to play in the ruck because they did acquire Steph Martin as well during the off-season. So I've got English Martin in the ruck there. 
Does he play forward? Well, that's certainly a possibility, but they do have some other options, such as a Bont that can go through there. You know, Libba, he can play as that sort of pressure small forward as well. So with Dunkley, yeah, it, it's all about what role he's going to be playing next year. Look, if he did ma make his way to Essendon, he'd be an absolute lock on our sides because we know that they would have recruited him to play that specific role. And when he does play that role, he can go absolutely massive. And that's why I love this pick. So check out some of these scores from 2019. If you look at rounds one to six, yeah, pretty poor there. Didn't manage to hit the ton. But then he had a really nice five-week period, 134, 136, 88, a little bit lower than a 130 and a 119. So really started to hit form. And then look at what this man did after the buy. He averaged 143 post buy. And look at that ceiling, a 173, a 202, a 153, a 169. As I said before, this bloke can go absolutely massive. So I'm sort of holding on to hope that given the fact that he was keen to leave the kennel and wanted to make his way over to Essendon, that the dogs will really want to keep him happy. I know that they really rate him. Look, did they ever even think about trading him? I'm not too sure, but they do really rate him as a player. He's got great leadership potential, a big, big part of their future in their eyes, I think. And I'm hoping that they'll want to keep him there. And in order to do that, I think they've got to play him in his most preferred role, which is that inside bull. So if that's the case, yeah, I think he could be the best forward this year. I think he could even average better than Dangerfield, but it's all about that role. So fingers crossed, he does start as that inside bull, attends those CBAs. If that's the case, he's going to be the best forward pick this year. If not, well, I still think he can go over 100. He'll probably lose a bit of money on that starting price there. But as you can see, he does have a good ceiling. He can go massive. So for me, I am starting Josh Dunkley, but I can understand why some people may be a little bit iffy on the pick. At number five, we've got Rowan Marshall. He'll set you back 557,200. Comes with DPP status this year as a ruck forward. He is one of my absolute locks in the forward line and probably my only absolute lock at this stage. Well, why is that? I just think that there's a lot of positive upside to this pick. Firstly, I think Ryder's going to spend a lot more time up forward, which will give him a lot more minutes as the number one ruck. We saw what he did in 2019. Massive breakout year from him. Went from 62.8 all the way up to a 110.2. So that is the absolute definition of a breakout year for him because he was given more responsibility. He's got that mature body now. He's strong. As I said, he's pretty athletic and gets around the ground pretty well. I just think he's going to be a super pick this year. Obviously, the DPP status helps a lot. He can be, obviously, switched in the forward line to cover for any of our rucks that might be missing for any reason. Um, if you look at his scores from last year, we've got a 70 there. 76, 74, uh, yeah, another 76. That's his absolute floor. You know, he's not going to go below 70. And he does have a bit of a big ceiling when he's given those, you know, ultimate ruck minutes. 160, a 143 there as well. You know, 129 couple of nice other scores including a 118 so i just think that there's so much upside to this pick i certainly don't think that he'll go down in average and i think that it, look it's even possible for him to go up to a 110 um i'd be happy with a 105 plus just lock him in at that price have him score well for me most weeks he won't give me really low scores and he's really really good cover as well so i think he's a bit of a no-brainer pick rowan marshall I'm locking him at 557,200. And if I've got any trouble in the rucks, he's a pretty easy switch in there for a week or two if I need him. At number six on the list, we've got Dusty. He'll set you back 541,600. The first two things on all cat with Dusty are his games played and then his previous averages. So all the way back from 2010, has not played under 20 games in a season. And even last year, he played the 16 games during the home and away season. But if we add the four finals, that still gets him to the 20 game mark. So a really, really durable type pick. He's got a history of being durable. His average is there, hit the ton for the first time in 2013, 101.8. Just went below in 2014, but after 2015, has not gone below 100. If you look at 2017, by far and away his career best year, that was his brown low year. Uber elite scoring, almost got to that 120 mark. But unfortunately, after that, from 2018 to 2020, he's gone a lot closer to the 100 mark. So 103.9, 100 on the dot, and then 100.8. So with Dusty, I suppose I'd describe him as a safe pick, but not a pick with a heap of upside. What do I think he'll average? Probably 95 to 102. I think that's probably his range. Why is he a safe pick? Well, if you look at those averages there, the data's there to show that he'll probably get close to 100 again. I don't think there's any reason for him 
to really drop an average, but I don't think, on the other hand, as well, that there's any reason for him to really spike up that average again. He, look, he's played a little bit more forward time after that 2017 season where he played predominantly through the midfield and just dominated there. But he, he almost reminds me um, of like a Ferrari that's just in cruise control for most of the time, you know, going down the highway, just cruising, you know, relaxing, doing what they need to do to get from A to B. But then they get a little bit impatient all of a sudden, jump in the right-hand lane, zoom past all the other cars in the road, and then jump back in that left-hand lane and start relaxing a little bit. We look at these, you know, scores from last year. Started off with a 126 against Carlton, as we know, play Carlton every year in round one, which is a really, really nice start. But then rounds two to round six, really mediocre type stuff. Doesn't hit the ton, you know, misses a game there, which is really, really rare for him. But then seven to 10 goes over the ton for four weeks in a row. So he goes in those real hot streaks, got a 184 in there as well. So he's one of those players that can be a little bit frustrating to own, but uh, he will have those lower scores, but then he will return the favor with some of those really, really high scores. So in league you know, matches, you might be coming up against someone with a dusty and it's a real flip of the coin. One week, he may get a 70 odd. The other week, he may really, really decide that he's gonna come and play and get a 140 plus. So. Yeah, as I said, I'd describe him as a safe pick, not a lot of upside. He'll probably hover, I think, between the sort of 500 to around that 540k mark. Look, if he gets on a hot streak, then he certainly could go up for a while. But uh, don't expect him to give you, I suppose, consistent scores. He'll give you some of those lower ones and some of the high ones, and it will sort of average out for those players that are playing for an overall rank during the season. So for me, I'd certainly consider him, but I don't think there's a whole heap of upside with him. At number seven, we've got Sonny Walters. He'll set you back 531,100. I'll say from the start, I'm not a huge fan of this pick. He has burnt me in the past. Look, I got him around the buy periods, expecting him to cover for a couple of buys, but then get suspended, misses the next game, and yeah, it was an absolute nightmare for me. So I haven't really forgiven him after that, but we can see in 2019 and 2020, they were his two best career years in regards to average, 100.8 than the 98.9 last year. Look at how he started off. You know, this, this guy got to the 600K mark by around five. 110, 148, 109, 113, you know, 92, 107, 101, 115. Started like a house on fire, but then unfortunately got injured and just never recaptured that form. I think a reason for that was that he spent less and less time in the midfield. You know, players like Chera, Brayshaw, they were killing it through there, playing really, really good football. So I think his role was more of a forward role. Um, so I think that plays a little bit of a part in the fact that that average did go way down after he came back from injury. And look, when players do come back from injury, yeah, they do get a little bit rusty and it takes them a couple of weeks to get back into the swing of things. But look, at his age, with his durability history, we can see there there's not too many seasons, you know, from 2009 that he's played every game uh, at the start. That may have been because he's a young fella. I don't know if he was injured all the way back then. But yeah, he's not the most durable type of pick. I don't think there's going to be a heap of upside. Um, I can't see him playing a lot of mid minutes with those blokes I just mentioned, you know, Caleb uh, Sarong in there as well. So 531,000 for me, I think it's a pass. But look, if he starts off for some reason like he did last year, I do doubt it very highly though, then he will be a good selection. But for me, I think there's a lot better options below this price. So hard pass for me to start with Michael Walters. At number eight, we have Dane the Magician Zorko. He'll set you back 525,800. Now, as a Lions man myself, I have had a fair few questions about this bloke. You know, what role is he going to play? Is he going to be a good starting selection this year? I'll do my best to answer those questions, but before I do, I'll look at some of the positives about the Zorko selection. We'll look at his career average there. Apart from one year, has not gone below 95. And if you look at two really good years there, managed to bump his way up to 109 and then 110.8, where he's almost in all Australian form. So that's a real positive about Zorko. Looking at numbers there anyway, you think he's pretty safe to go anywhere between the 95 to probably the 100 mark this year. That's ultra consistent, and that's what we want with our super coach players. Look at his games played there. 22 up to 22 from 2013 up to 2019. Really, really durable in the past. That's also a big tick when we're looking to select players in our starting side. Now, that sort of does lead me, that durability, into one of the negatives. So last year, he was dealing with a couple of injuries. One was with his calf and the other was with his Achilles. So he was managing his training loads. I think there are a few times there where he didn't even train during the week just to make sure that he got up for the game. So... Round three, round five, obviously missed as well. 
And as I said, he was just really, really sore during the season. I think that he may have even said himself that it's something he may need to manage for the rest of his career. So someone at his age, he's over 30 now. Remember, he did enter the system as a mature age pick, originally drafted from the Suns on trade to the Lions, which was a really, really good trade for us, I think. So he is a little bit older than probably the game's tally that you'll see there and that's something to keep in mind as well when blokes at his age start to get these types of injuries yeah there's some real red flags to me the second thing is in regards to his role now this is just my opinion but i think that he will transition more into the forward line this year you know we've got blokes like bailey rayner that are really to take that next step i think and start to play through the midfield so i think it makes sense that zorko probably spends a little bit more time forward and that can really affect his ceiling as well you look last year even that ceiling, you know, I suppose that floor rather than the ceiling, 52, 47, 61, 68. Yeah, that's certainly not great. And if he doesn't get those mid minutes, I doubt we will be able to produce those really, really big scores that will balance out that lower scores that he's been getting, um, as you can see from 2020. So that's a concern. Look, he can be a damaging forward. You know, um, he can work well with Cameron. He can hit the scoreboard. Great pressure type player. You know, he can tackle. That's what he based his game off, his speed. But yeah, that concern with that Achilles speed does worry me a little bit. So, look, you can make up your own mind about Dane Zorko, but for me, the fact that, yeah, he, is, he was dealing, dealing with those injuries anyway last year that I think possibly could linger on into this year, and the fact that he will be spending less time in the midfield makes him a less attractive proposition for me, but you're not paying the world for him. He's got a great history, and he still could spend a large majority of minutes in the midfield and give you some really nice scores. So, for me... I'm not starting with him, but I can see why some people may look to. At number nine, we have Big Charlie Dixon, the second of our key forwards that are featured in the top 10. He'll set you back 498,700. Look, I'm not going to spend a heap of time on this pick because I really don't think that I can endorse him. As I said, key forward can be really inconsistent. We see scores there, 62, 29, 63, and then bang, massive ceiling, 165 at a 143 but in order to get those really big scores he needs big bags he needs lots of contested marks he needs to absolutely dominate so for me just a little bit too inconsistent the scoring history there isn't anything to write home about he has had a couple of seasons where he's gone above 90 2017 90.9 and all the way back in 2013 with a 90.5 but other averages in there you know three consecutive years in the high 60s you know 78 another 64 for me yeah, I just wouldn't go there. And if you're going for someone, you know, from Port Adelaide, I'd be going for someone like a Zach Butters or a Connor Rosie, who I'll talk about a little bit later. So I pretty much that's all I've got to say on Charlie Dixon. I would not select him. If you're going from Ultra Pod or if you've got some man love for him, get him in your side. But for me, hard nails the starting pick. And rounding out the top 10, we have Dixon's teammate, Robbie Gray. He'll set you back 491,900. Been a great scorer in the past. Three years there, 111, 110.4, 108.1 was one of the most damaging midfielders in the competition. But unfortunately for Super Coach owners, his average has dipped for the last four years from 2017 to 2020, where he's gone around that 90 mark. What's the reason for that? Well, his role has almost completely changed and he now plays as more of a permanent forward that just pinch hits in the midfield when needed. If you do look at last year though, probably from round nine, round 10, he did start to spend some more time running through the midfield there and that did result in some really really nice scores there you know 106 133 149 120 and a 107 that's really really good for someone like Robbie Gray particularly someone that we can select as a forward but round 11 only 384 and what was the reason for that well look at those scores there you know started the year with a 104 which was nice but then took him what eight rounds to get to his next ton and lots of mediocre scores lots of those 70 type scores that you just don't want in your side when you can get a rookie that's getting closer to a 60 for you those 70 type scores can be really really frustrating as an owner but he does have a big ceiling as we can see there but with the emergence of blokes like butters rosie i simply don't see Robbie Gray spending much more time in the midfield. And don't get me wrong, he is an elite forward, and that's great for someone like Ken Hinckley because you can now rely, hopefully, on some of these younger blokes to start playing there, and you do have the luxury of probably playing Gray as a full-time forward, I think, next year or this year, coming into 2021. So for me, it's now as a starting pick, but if he plays midfield minutes or if, you know, there's a couple of injuries there and he's looking to get that new role, he's certainly someone that you may look to jump on. All right, so now it's time to take a look at some of the midfielders that are going to set us back 400 to 500k. Now, if you look at the man at the top right-hand side of the screen, Christian Petrarca, 
He was one of my starting selections in between the 400 to 500k range last year, and he worked out absolutely magnificently. Increased his average by 35 plus points. Why was that? Well, we know what type of talent he was. We were waiting for this for years and years, but the big thing was he had a major role change, and he played full-time midfield in 2020, and that's a big reason why I think he was able to increase his average so much. So the big question in everyone's minds going into this year, I think, is who is going to be the next Christian Petrarca. Now, I don't think there's necessarily any players here that can increase their average by as much as Petrarca did last year, but there are a few blokes, I think, who can certainly increase their average by 10 to 15 points if all things go well. The first bloke we'll talk about here is Zach Butters. Love this guy as a player. Spills was all over him during the preseason as well, and I can see why, because he's a real contested type player, loves getting in there, putting his body in, he's a clutch type player, and he got scaled really well last year, a couple of moments where he really helped to change the game, and change the direction of the game, and get that back in Port's favour, so I really love that about him as a pick. The main question for us is, when is he going to break out? When is he going to spend more and more time in the midfield? And I think the answer to that is that he'll spend a little bit more time in the midfield this year, certainly as compared to last year. But I'm just not quite sure if he's going to spend enough time in the midfield. So my plan with Butters at this stage, and look, if he scores 100 plus in the, the practice match that we get to see, or the preseason game, sorry, then he's going to really, really tempt me. And I know that he'll tempt a lot of other people. But my plan probably is at this stage is to not start him, wait and see what his role is, give him maybe five to six weeks, and even pay up the extra 50 or whatever K I'll have to spend just so I can make more of an educated decision, I suppose, and get more of an educated opinion on what his role is going to be. So for me, I'm not starting him at this stage, but he does have the potential to have a really, really big year, I think. Next guy on the list there, Shy Bolton. I think he's very similar to Butters. He has the potential to break out. I really, really rate him as a player. He was in the same draft as Klugger, Taranto, McGrath. So I think if they redid the draft now, he would have been selected close to the top 10 because he's got a heap of talent, this bloke. Why did he go well last year? Well, it's really interesting. As soon as Prestia went down, his CBAs went right up and they increased steadily throughout the whole year. So before Prestia got injured last year, he attended basically no CBAs, first couple of rounds, 0%, a couple of the next rounds, but as soon as Prestia went down, it's like he almost stepped into that role. So the concern with Bolton this year is Prestia is now back, he's fully fit from all reports. What is Bolton's role going to be going into this year? Does he lose some of those CBA attendances? Does he play a little bit more time forward? Maybe on a wing, I'm not too sure. He's got really good pace. I think with him, he can be used in a variety of positions and play pretty well. So that's our main concern with the Bolton pick. Is he going to play enough midfield time? If you think it's yes, then he could be someone that you look at to start. But again, like a Butters, I'd much rather wait and see. And if he's looking to get that permanent role and score pretty consistently, then someone maybe I can get into my side, even if I have to pay up a little bit more for him. Now, Isaac Heaney, as George would call him, why Zach Heaney? For me, I'm not going to start with him, even though it is a really tempting price. We saw in the intro there that he'd been up in regards to averages for a fair few years now. He's never really gone that solid 100, 100 plus, but he's always around the 90 to 95 mark, as we know. But at this stage, he's still not in full training, and that's just a big concern for me. Even if he plays forward, I still think that he can play well, but we're always worried that when he goes up for a mark, he's going to fall down little bit awkwardly, do something to an ankle, miss a few weeks here, that could then stretch out a little bit longer. It's always a bit of a concern with Heaney. So if he was flying and at full fitness and you know had some runs on the board during the preseason, he'd be certainly someone I'd be considering to start my side. But given the fact that he's still not back to full training, he's just a no as a starting pick for me. Chad Wingard, just no for me. Um, too inconsistent, plays a lot of forward time. I don't think he'll get those mid-minutes. Has burnt me a couple of times in the past, so absolute no from me. I just don't think that there's a value there or the mid-time available, so a bit of a fake. Um, well, you wouldn't call him a premium, would you? But, um, yeah, certainly someone that I'm not a fan of. Toby Green, 448K. I never really liked starting Green in my side because of the NDHP policy. If you don't know what that is, go and check out my Supercoach Vernacular video where I go through all the common terms that I use. But because of that fact... We don't know what he's going to do next. Is he going to get suspended? I just hate starting this bloke. He has made his way into my side a couple of times 
over the years. One I remember was when he started to get some midfield time, some increased midfield time. I think they were just decimated with injuries at the Giants there. A similar time, I think, when Zach Williams may have got some mid-time there as well. And he looks sublime in there, Toby Green. Can rack up the possessions, really, really dangerous, and has monster scores to his name when he plays in that particular role. But given the fact that he is such a good forward, I don't think that he moves away from that role. And he'll probably average about what he's priced at currently, I think. So no for a starting pick for Toby Green for me. Absolute no for Jack Martin. Keep it simple. You know, he won't be getting any mid-time. Very inconsistent type player. We'll give you a couple of good scores here and there, but I think we'll see a lot more of those lower scores given the fact that he'll be playing predominantly as a forward this year. Exciting type player, but no as a starting pick for me. Jordan Dugowie, just torn his stomach muscle. Will be out for a couple of weeks before he can resume training again, but even before that, he was a hard no from me. Even when he has been trolled in the midfield, he hasn't looked that great to me. Uh, there has been a couple of times where he has looked pretty sublime, but apart from that, has been pretty ordinary, and I think he's played his best football up in the forward line. But again, very inconsistent, very up and down. Sometimes he looks like that million-dollar player. Other times it looks like you should be forking out 350k maximum for him. So given the fact that he's got some on-field, uh, sorry, off-field issues, the NDHP policy also applies to him. I would not look to start him in my side this year. Zach Bailey, now this bloke's a really interesting pick. I love him as a player, and I think that he can eventually make his way into elite players in the competition. Now, he's got some danger field-like qualities, in my opinion, that real burst of pace off the mark. He's getting stronger, got some great pace to him, can play inside, can play outside as well. I think he'll be getting some more mid-minutes this year. Will there be enough mid-minutes for him to go sort of past that 500k mark, push his average closer to 100 Again, I'm not too sure on this, so it's a little bit of guesswork, but I love all the attributes that he's got. Where will he play his footy this year? Well, I think he's the perfect sort of option, and I don't know if this is great for Supercoach, but to probably start on the bench, given the fact that he can play back, mid, on the outside, on the inside, or play as a high half forward as well. So given the fact that he's so versatile, I just don't know where he's going to be playing the majority of footy. At a guess, I'd say through the midfield, and I'm hoping that's the case. If that is the case, then he could be a really, really valid selection this year. Also got that DPP status, which is always handy. So for me, I'm a bit of a wait and see on Zach Bailey. I'd love to be able to confidently select him in my side during the year because I'm a real fan of how he plays his footy. Only going to get better. So if you want to select him in your starting side, you're taking a little bit of a gamble here but the reward could be really, really fine. And you are saving about 50K from a Butters, Bolton type. And I think he's someone with probably as much potential as those blokes anyway. Dan Butler, interestingly, I've had a couple of questions about him. I was surprised about that, but he doesn't play a super coach friendly role. We saw some nice scores from him during the season last year. Started off really, really well, but that tapered off pretty quickly. So I wouldn't go anywhere near the Dan Butler pick. If you're getting someone like a Zach Paley for four grand more, just go with someone like a Bailey, I think. And the last bloke on this list before we get to the next group of players in the next price range is Tommy Phillips. So at the start, I sort of, oh yeah, he could be okay. Sort of scrolled past him, didn't think too much about him. But as I was looking deeper into the forwards at their particular prices, he's probably someone that stands out a little bit for me. We've seen what he can do when he's playing that wing role back at Collingwood. Average in the 90s, looked pretty good there, but he didn't play that role last year and um, he was sort of thrown around into the forward mix and it just wasn't his most preferred role now obviously with Isaac, Isaac Smith going Tom Scully's gone he is an absolute 100% lock to be the starting wing wing for Hawthorne next year and I think 402k there is the opportunity for him to come into that sort of top eight forwards I think for average I think that he will be pretty consistent I think he'll be able to find the ball pretty good disposal on him as well and I think that he could be actually a pretty solid selection. Now, is there enough value in the pick? You're certainly picking him to probably end as your F5, most likely, or hopefully your F6. But if all things go well, I think he could certainly hover around that 500k mark, get into the top 10 for averages mid, um, for forwards, and um, be a bit of a handy selection. So if he's on your watch list, I can certainly see why. He's definitely on mine. And depending on structure, he could sort of fit the bill for a player that you're hoping could average 90 to maybe 95 for your F6.
Now the 300 to 400k price range is a really, really awkward price range in my opinion. It's tough to get these selections right. You've generally got some fallen premiums that maybe haven't played some football in a while due to injury. You've got some of those breakout contenders. At times you've got some of those first year rookies that average decent numbers in their first year and are now not valid due to the fact that they don't present much value. So it's really, really tough as I said to get this price range correct. You've got someone like Andy Brayshaw last year, 382,800, who I selected in my starting team as a real breakout contender. He worked out really, really well. But unfortunately, looking at this list of players, I don't think that we've got too many Andy Brayshaws going into 2021. So I've got 10 blokes here that I will discuss, some more valid than others, I think, but with pretty much all these picks, I've got one concern or another. So we'll start off with Kona Rosie, as you've got there, a genuine talent, the type of bloke who I think will be an absolute star of the competition in the years to come. What's the issue with him in regards to super coach? Well, he's been playing mainly as a forward and not through the midfield. So the big question for me, and it's very similar to a Zach Butters, is how much mid time is Rosie going to get? If it's a fair chunk of midfield time, I think he would be an awesome selection. But if it's still going to be mainly forward, spending just a little bit of time here and there in the midfield, then I don't know if he's going to be a great starting pick. And look, at 377, you're probably selecting him as a keeper at that price. I don't think it really makes sense to select him there and you know look to upgrade him. I think that you'll probably be looking for him as a keeper. So yeah, look, a 90 plus average is now the question if he spends a fair bit of time in the midfield, but if not, it could be a little bit dicey. So uh, it's definitely a wait and see and could be a really, really good selection if he's played in the correct position. And Jeremy Cameron, I've owned this bloke a couple of times before. He's an absolute yo-yo selection, will go really, really big, then go really, really down. And the issue for him is the fact that usually these things tend to balance out, you know, the really big with the really poor scores, but we just haven't seen enough of the bigger scores from him lately. So for me, nah, he's a roller coaster. He's a yo-yo, will give you no consistency, I don't think. Look, he may improve that average from last year. He's a really good player, you know, he's a great forward with a lot of talent. Down there at Geelong now, maybe a little bit happier. So I'm not saying that his average will continue to go down, but I just wouldn't select him as a starting pick because, again, you're probably selecting him as a keeper. Reese Matheson, be quick with this one. All I've got there is don't get fooled by his 2020 average. He did play one game, got above a 90. I think it was about a 93. And people may look at that average and think, wow, geez, at this price point, he's an absolute bargain. So please don't get fooled by that. Not in the best 22 behind other players that would be vying for that position like a Dev Robertson, uh, Cam Ellis Yolman, uh, even someone like an Eli Smith. So don't select him, he's not best 22. Even though I love the bloke, you know, he's a real crazy bloke, I've met him a few times at family days and you know, my type of fella, but uh, don't select him in your starting squad. Jamie Elliott, now I've had a couple of questions about this bloke. There's been a little bit of talk possibly that he may be spending a little bit more time in the midfield. If that's the case, Look, he could boost that average up for sure, but I'm always a little bit worried about his durability, his consistency, and I'm just not sure, again, if the value is there for Jamie Elliott. But he'll certainly be a pod, I think. But at this stage, unless there's some very, very strong signals or signs that he will be playing a lot of midfield minutes, then I just would not go near the pick, to be quite uh, honest. Jaden Stevenson, again, I'm really unsure about this bloke. What's going to happen there at North Melbourne in regards to different players? David Noble comes in to play his keeper role. Does he look to change things up? We know that Zeeble might be looking to go back to the back line. That's pretty much even being confirmed by Noble and Zeeble themselves. So it's a really tough pick at that price point, 350k. It's a bit of a gamble. I think that's what it is. You're sort of gambling that something may happen. But in the forward line, in that role, he'll have a few good games, but I just don't think he'll be consistent enough for you. So I know from me. Now this bloke is probably the player that interests me the most out of all the players on this list. It's Jai Caldwell. So the upside to him is that there's certainly a position for him in the starting S and midfield. I think they're lacking a player with his type of skills. He can get the contested possessions. He's not a huge possession winner. That's a little bit of a problem, but hopefully due to his strong body or stronger body, he can put a fair bit of de defensive pressure on and possibly even look to get that tackle count up. But the issue is, even as a junior, he didn't score overly well. We haven't seen a lot of him at GWS. A lot of that was due to opportunity and possibly if they didn't have such a strong midfield, we would have seen a little bit more of Caldwell um, and make a more educated decision on him. But I think the reason why we'd look to select him is the opportunity and the role 
that he's been presented with down there at Eston. So what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to monitor his pre-season, look at how he performs in the practice match, where is he playing, where are his minutes going, um, and then look at how he goes in the pre-season practice matches and try to make more of an educated decision, sorry. So keep him on your watch list, but certainly, yeah, no guarantees with that pick yet. Nick Hind, 331k. Well, the only reason why I've sort of brought up this bloke is that I have heard that he may be filling that vacant half-back role. You know, he's got a bit of speed there, likes to kick the ball. Saad's gone, McKenna's gone, so there are a couple of spots there up for grabs. And I've heard just on the download that he may be one of those players that's given first opportunity at that role. So, look, he's never been in my side at any stage during the season, but he's just a bloke, a pod, I think, just to monitor, and he could be a little bit of a sneaker pick if he gets that role. Tommy McDonald, well... I've got that he'll be a pod pick. There's been a little bit of talk about him lately, given the fact that Ben Brown's now gone down with injury. But in a way, that doesn't really make sense to me because Brown wasn't there last year in 2020 at the D's, and McDonald still had a poor season. He was given some opportunities, but just wasn't up to it, unfortunately, last year. And people argue that, look, he's had some great years in regards to average, but most of those good years were when he was back there in defence. So he did have one good year forward and that's when Jesse Hogan left they must have had a lot of confidence in him that he'd be able to hold the fort with Weedman and maybe be the number one man Weedman that second string type player but unfortunately yeah he's really gone down an average and really lost that form I did look at an interview with him uh, it was meant to be this candid sit down interview where he's honest and opens up about the fact that he didn't have a great year last year he had some honest conversations with Goody at the end of the year and he gave him some pretty open and strong feedback and I think a lot of it was due to his fitness because he did mention now I've come back a lot fitter yada 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 so that probably had something to do with it but given the fact Brown wasn't there last year I find that hard to use an, as an excuse sorry um, and not really as a reason why to now look at getting Tom McDonald in he may work out but for me it's a pass Buddy Franklin, the name gets you excited automatically, but I'm not getting too excited because his durability is a major concern. Still not at full fitness, still not running properly at this stage, and he'll take a while, I think, to get his body right and his confidence in his body right to get back to AFL level. So, look, he may play around one. I'm really not too sure. But even if he does, I think that he won't be at full fitness and uh, he'll be a little bit rusty because he's missed a lot of footy over the last couple of years. So, no at this stage for Buddy. And last bloke there, Jesse Hogan. Well, look, I've got there. If he was 250k, he'd be in my starting side. But at 310k, the price point just doesn't work for me. A little bit too much of a risk for me. Back at Melbourne, had a really good stage where he was playing some midfield minutes. Averaged, I think, about 115 over a four-week stretch. Some really nice scores there. Kicked goals as well during that stage. But we know what happens at GWS. That's why Caldwell and these types, Haley yeah, flowing away from there because they simply didn't get the opportunity. So he won't be going back to that role, I don't think, at the Giants where he could average possibly some nice numbers in the midfield. He will be one of their main targets there. But for me, 310000 just too much of a risk, unfortunately. And I do like a few more blokes who are in the next price range, which would be two hundred to three hundred k now again, at this price point, there's certainly lots of question marks about all the players on this list. But I think this is where we can get a little bit more value and potentially afford to take a few more risks. So the first player I've got there is ex-captain Nathan Jones. He'll set you back 292100 with DPP status. Look, to be completely honest, I'm even surprised that he's playing in 2021. I thought he'd retire at the end of last year. And I even think I've got question marks on whether or not he's in their best 22. Look, he's been an absolute champion for the club. As I said, ex-captain, been a great leader in some of the real dark times there. But I really think that he's going to be overtaken this year and may not even be a regular in the side. So for me to know, but look, he could find a permanent role in the back line there and maybe boost that average up um, by five to 10 points, let's just say. But for me, I don't think there's enough value there for him and a few too many question marks for mine. Now, Fantasia, I don't think he's necessarily going to be a relevant super coach selection, but one thing I didn't mention in regards to the Rosie and the Butters pick is the fact that they have now acquired Fantasia, who is definitely going to be playing 
in the forward line. So I think that's actually positive news for Rosie and Butters in particular because he's very likely to play that forward role and that may allow those type of blokes to get freed up a little bit more to spend more time in the midfield. So I wouldn't really be selecting him as a forward myself. He's also a defender there as well at 271. So got that DPP status, may tempt some people, but Noel's a starting pick for me, but I think it could be good for a couple of other players at Port Adelaide for their super coach averages. Uh, Jack Siebel, now I did watch or listen, sorry, to an interview from David Noble the other week. He pretty much confirmed that he's looking to put Zeeble in the back line now. He says that he can shape the ball or help to shape their ball movement. He reads the play really, really well. So I think that Noble thinks that he can offer a fair bit there in the back line. Now, I wasn't sure sort of what his skill set would be there in the back line or, you know, how he'd really make a difference or a positive difference. But Noble did mention that he's looking at something similar to a Hodge role, so a bit of an organiser down there. We'll look at his history as well. Had a really, really healthy average, nothing like the 100-plus sort of average, but 80s, we can deal with that, particularly at someone like this pri at this price. Sorry. So Zebul for me, he's a really, really tempting pick, someone that I'm definitely considering, but I want to see exactly what he looks like down back. There's been a lot of talk about it, but I haven't actually seen it for myself. So if he's looking good down there, Looks like he's going to play that role permanently. He could definitely wake his way into my side. Jaden Hunt, now he'll be a bit of a pod selection. Scoring history doesn't suggest anything great, but I have heard that he may be looking to return back to that half-back role, that running half-back role. So isn't the best use of the ball, I understand that, but I really think with his run and carry and his pace, he will find a little bit of the ball if he's played back down there, and that is a really super coach-friendly position for me. So Hunt at that price, 263. Have a look at how he's going in the preseason and maybe worth a little bit of a gamble as a real pod. Unfortunately, Benny Brown had this bloke on the side. Not really much to discuss now because his knee's blown out. I think he's going to have surgery, so he won't be available in the early rounds of the season. Real disappointment um, because he was in my side, really suited my structure, but now just scratch him off your list, unfortunately. Townsend, well, he was a bit of a failed pick last year. Made his way to the Gold Coast from Essendon. At the start, he was one of those players, I think he was about 200k, that some people did see a little bit of value in. I think he had the one good score, possibly, but then really nothing after that. So, will he be a tagger I've got there? He has done that in the past, and maybe they're looking to, for someone to do that at the Gold Coast. So, there may be a role if they put a specific tagger in there, but we've seen Miller do that. I'm not quite sure if he'll even get a game, maybe an insurance policy. So Noel's a starting pick for me unless they've got some injuries there. Joey Danaher now. I'm a Lions man, as you know. I'm very, very excited by this man. 233K. Look, we know what his injury history is like. It's been well documented. And I don't mean to rub it into the face of Essendon fans, but he has not missed a beat up at Brisbane. So he's attended every session, done some extra sessions, sorry, before he was even due back at full training. So... All signs are pointing to a really strong year from him. Look, I'm not counting on the chickens yet. High chance that he may get injured, but we don't need Danaher on our sides for too long, I don't think. You know, a few good games in a row, even two solid games in a row around that 90-plus mark, and he could start to make you some really, really quick money. And I think he's one of those blokes that gives you not only some potential value, but solid, solid job security each week. Durability obviously being that concern, but... At the moment, I'm all on board the Danaher train, flying up at Brisbane and is in my starting team currently. The other bloke that is in my starting team is Jarman Impey. Now, it depends on, on one thing, and that's his role. So if he's going to be playing that forward role this year, I probably won't look to start him. But if he's going back to that half-back role, that's his most preferred role. I mentioned in another video, I think it was my team reveal, that I did watch an interview on him. He said that that's his most preferred role, where he thinks he's his most damaging and that's where he's hoping, anyway, to play this year. So if that's the case, coming off halfback, he had a really nice stint a couple of years ago, I think it was, where he averaged about 85 for about an eight-game stretch. So that points to some positive signs at a bloke that you can get for 212k. And again, similar to Danaher, he's best 22 guaranteed every week. It's just that role that he plays. So given the fact that I think there's a high chance that he will be going back to the halfback, allow him to use his pace, use his explosion off the back line there. I think he could be a really solid selection in my side currently. 
And now the bloke we've got on the list here is Paddy Dow. Now, this is more about, I suppose, potential. We haven't seen anything really from Dow that would suggest that he's going to be a good pick. But in the preseason, he has been talked up by some of the coaches. He was a very early pick, number three for memory. I suppose the concern for me is where does he fit in that midfield? We know they're going to have a strong midfield. And I don't know if he's going to be able to push his way in there. Um, there may be another position elsewhere where he could look to try to get into the best 22. But I have doubts on whether it will be in the midfield. But look, if he does string some dames together, he could be a little bit of a, a value option. Sorry, But when you've got Impey there and Danaher at a similar price, I think they're probably a little bit safer than Paddy Dow. So that's my thoughts on the forwards 2 to 300k. So that's it for now, guys. It certainly was a long one. Thank you very much for watching until the end. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you got a little bit out of it and it answered maybe some of the questions that you've had in regards to some of the 2021 forwards this year. As a quick way of saying thank you for watching all the way until the end, I am putting out my first league code. So that will be 335. 865 jump into your league sections now and i'd love to see you in the super coach with dr subscriber league one so thanks again guys for all the support great to see all the new subscribers on board and great to see all the regulars that were also with me last year so hope your team plan is going well and i'll see you soon in the next one cheers bye